you have your Bibles, look with me in Romans chapter 12. We're getting back to the series that we began last January. We've been away from it uh, for about a month or two. And uh, we want to get back to it and here for the next maybe three Sundays. And uh, hopefully I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, we'll be hitting everything as we have been doing. But I'm going to hit some highlights on some things that I believe is very important for us to look at as we get all the way through chapter 16 of Romans here. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 12, a few verses there, verses 1 and 2 here in just a few moments. I guess I would ask you the question as we begin, since you came to know Christ, those of you who are Christians, and I hope everyone is, and if not, I hope that you will surrender your life to Jesus. But since you've come to know Jesus, how are you living your life? How are you living it? Have you surrendered it all to the Lord? Are you being everything that He wants you to be? Is there something that you are holding back? Something you haven't surrendered to the Lord? If not, God is calling every single one of us as believers in Him to be sold out to Him wholeheartedly. 100% is what God desires of us. In chapter 12, Paul begins by making this urgent plea with the church, with those who are part of, of the body of Christ here in this early church stage. He gives out this call of urgency to those who are Jews and those who are Gentiles who know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And he begins this chapter with a word. And that word is therefore. Therefore. It is a, a word that refers to what came before it. He says, therefore. He had said something earlier back in chapter 11. It's known as this conjunctive adverb is what the word therefore is. It tells what the results are because of what preceded it or what should happen or what you should do because of what was said previously. Therefore, is what Paul says as he points to chapter 11. In chapter 11, Paul has some very important things to say. We haven't gone through chapter 11, but I just kind of want to highlight it right, really quick. It says this on the screen. Here's some things that, that Paul speaks about. He, he speaks about the remnant of Israel, right? Here is Israel. For the majority of Israel, they had rejected Christ. They are not accepting Jesus as the Savior, as the Messiah. They have still been trying to live their life by the law, thinking that was going to make them righteous and that was going to bring them to heaven and get them to God. But they had rejected Christ. But God said, even though there are those that have rejected him, there's still going to be a remnant. Right? That small portion. But that remnant was going to come not from all of those who claimed to be Israelites, but those that are descended from Abraham to Isaac and Jacob. We're going to be those that's going to be a part of that remnant. He goes on. He talks about those who are grafted in. And those who are grafted in, guess what? Who is that? Us. That's us. That's you and I. That's the Gentiles. That's those that weren't a part of the Jewish race. Those who weren't a part of the chosen people. Instead, God, he says, he grafts us in. You know, Scripture says salvation comes first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, right? And so he talks about how there are those branches that have been cut off. Speaking of those Jewish people that had rejected him. And God begins to allow their hearts to be hardened, right? But then it is a time, even today, for Gentiles, those who are not a part of the Jewish race, that come into the body of Christ. To become part of the church. And he goes on, he reminds the Gentiles of God's kindness, of his mercy. God allowed us to come into the body of Christ, even though we weren't a part of the chosen race, even though we weren't a part of the chosen people, the Israelites, God's kindness allows us to have an opportunity to believe in Jesus and to come to know him. It's through God's kindness. We don't deserve that. None of us do. 
No people in all the world deserve to be a part of the kingdom of God, but through God's kindness, he allows us to. And he teaches also that all of Israel will be saved. Now, there's a lot of controversy, a lot of disputes, a lot of different opinions in the theology about who is all of Israel. But again, it's going to come from those that's a part of from Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac's race. I mean, descendants. And so at some point in time, believing some, that is during the millennium, uh, when Jesus sets up his, his, uh, his kingdom here on earth for those thousand years, a lot of those Israelites, those that's a part of Israel, Abraham's descendants, true descendants, part of the promise, are going to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. That time is coming. And he says these things happen because of one reason. They happen because of God's mercy. Because God had mercy. You understand mercy? Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Right? You don't get what you should get. Grace is the opposite. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. Right? And that is our salvation. Because of God's mercy. Right? He allows us to share in His grace. Paul begins to speak here about therefore and begins to make this plea right here in chapter 12. Let's sort of read these verses of Scripture. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, it says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good, pleasing. He says, perfect will. These are words that Paul writes as he is anointed and inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, not only to Jews who have come to know Christ, but also to the Gentiles. Those who are not a part of the Jewish race. Those who've come to know Jesus. Their voices. Because of what took place in chapter 11 that we read. Paul urges you, he says. I, I beg with you. I, I plead with you. Give yourself totally to God. That's what he's, all, what he's saying. Give yourselves completely to the Lord. You have to understand, Paul had this authority as an apostle of Christ to command this. To command that you give yourselves completely. But instead, he begs. He pleads. He urges. He tries to get across the importance of this act of the body of Christ that we sell out to him. Why? Because... God's mercy. Because God had given mercy to those who did not deserve it. He had mercy on the Jews as well as the Gentiles. He gave second chances to those who had rebelled. How many of you here today say, I praise the Lord, He gave me a second chance, right? Amen. He had mercy then to those who had been disobedient. Because of God's mercy, Paul pleads with those who are living for Jesus, the Jews and the Gentiles, to sell out completely. You see, Paul understood the importance of this. He understood what it meant that for us as the church, that we are to give ourselves completely to the Lord. Here's our main point today. You can see it here. He says, we are called to live like Christ, not to live like the world. That's pretty much the main point of this. We're to live like Christ completely, 100%, sold out, holding nothing back. We're not to be living like the world that we're surrounded in. We may be living in the world, but we're not to live like the world. We're to live giving ourselves completely to Jesus, living like Jesus. God does not call us to live like everyone else lives in the world. He does not call us to have the same habits. He does not call us to have the same vices. He does not call us to have the same lifestyle. He doesn't call us to blend in with the world and to look like them. 
He doesn't, listen, He doesn't call us not to, remember, not to make waves. It's okay to have the opposition against the world. It's all right. Not just to sit in and accept it all. God calls us to be like Him. To imitate Him. To follow the steps of Jesus. He calls us to take the narrow road. Not the broad road that the world takes. Right? He calls us to not go the way that seems right to us in our own thinking that leads to destruction. But He calls us to be holy. And to take the high road. Where the scripture says, this is the way, walk in it. That's what God has called us to do. But for so many Christians today, and so many churches today, people say, yes, I'm a Christian. We try to live for Christ while we're looking like the world. And that's not acceptable. That's not what God has called us to. God calls us to be sanctified. You understand that? What that means, it means to be separate. It means to be set apart. It means you can't ride the fence. You can't play both sides. But you give yourself completely to the Lord. Sanctified. Set apart from the ways of this world and living a life that glorifies God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, Paul writes these words. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, he says. As God has says, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, listen. Listen to what he says. Come out from them, he says. Come out from them. Be separate. Be separate, he says. And touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. God's speaking to the Jewish people who try to say, yes, we're God's people, but at the same time, they're clinging to all these false worship and all the things of the world. And God says, what do I have to do with those things? I have nothing with those things. You come out from them. You separate yourself from them. And I will be your God and you will be my people and I will accept you, he says. God called them out from false idols and false worship. And listen, God calls us out from the world today. He calls us out from that. So how do we live like Christ? Let's look at what Paul says here in those verses. Three or four things here really quick. First he says this. We live like Christ by being a living sacrifice. By being a living sacrifice. Right there in verse, verse 1. Therefore... I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, right, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Paul pleads. He, he, he begs again with the church, give your body, give your life as a living sacrifice. We go back to the Old Testament. We remember the, the practice of, of sacrifice. They brought a goat or they brought a lamb or, or they brought doves and they brought it to the priest and, and it was slaughtered and it was put on the altar and, and the blood would be dripped down and it would cover the altar. It was a sacrifice for their sins and tried to help them to be in that right relationship with the Lord. They were practicing the law. Listen, God calls us today to bring a sacrifice. But it's not one where we bring some animal and we slaughter it and we lay it on some altar. Today, the sacrifice is you. It is your life. But it is not one that is killed. It is one that is living. It is one that we live for Jesus every single day. You offer your body, your life, everything about you. And we lay it on the spiritual altar of God. And we say, God, here I am. Here I am, Lord. And I sacrifice myself to you. I give myself to you. I die to self. I no longer live for me and what I want and what I desire and what I wish or what I think is okay. I don't live to please me, but I live for you and for you alone. as sacrifice. That's what God calls it. That's what Paul is urging. He's begging the church. Give yourself to the Lord. Sacrifice. It's 
the question for us today would be, have you done that? Have we done that? Have you died to self? Have you offered your life as a living sacrifice to God? Every day you are to sacrifice yourself through your lifestyle, through your language, through your habits, through your witness to God so that the world would make no mistake that you belong to Jesus and no one else. That you belong to God. Have you done that? Do you do that? God, that's what God's called us to. The Victorian Cross is Canada's highest military honor. It's very similar to our uh, Medal of Honor in the United States. It says these medals are awarded for personal acts of valor, above and beyond the call of duty. And of the thousands awarded up to date, more citations have been bestowed for those falling on grenades to save the comrades uh, of other people through some single act and giving their whole life away. It states that the first Victorian Cross of World War II was awarded to a company sergeant major named John Robert Osborne. The sergeant major and his men were cut off from the battalion. They were under heavy attack. When the enemy came close enough, the Canadian soldiers were subjected to a concentrated barrage of grenades. And several times, it says, Osborne protected his men by picking up the live grenades and throwing them back. And eventually, one came in and landed in a position that he had no time to grab it and to throw it away. In a split second, he yells to his, his men who were there with him, who were trapped, and then he throws himself on the grenade, immediately losing his life. But the rest of the company survived that battle because of Osborne's selfless sacrifice. He sacrificed his life for the life of others. When we, as the church, are the living sacrifice to God, our lives are not our own. We, we give it away to glorify the one who gave himself away for us. Paul says, I urge you, I plead with you, I beg you, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. He goes on. And the second thing we see here is this, is that we live like Christ by being holy and pleasing to God. Holy and pleasing to the Lord. God calls us to be holy. Look what he says there again in verse, in verse 1. He says, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, he says. Offer it, sacrifice, holy and pleasing. He calls us to that. To be like him. And he is holy and as his church. You know what? We are to be what? Holy. We're to be holy. In everything that we do. In being holy, we keep ourselves in account. So that no one can bring question or doubt about our faith. We live in such a way that no one is confused of what a Christian looks like. Can that be said of you? Can it be said of us? Can people look at us and say, that's a Christian. That's a Christian. I remember the story in the scripture talks about Elijah. And he's walking through the village and he's shooting my woman. And he says, there goes a holy man. There goes a man of God. Can they say that of us? There goes a holy person, a woman, man, teenager. Can they say that of us? We do as the scripture calls us to. We live above reproach to where there's no questions asked about who we are in Jesus. See, to be holy is to be obedient, is to be sacrificial, is to be pleasing to God in all areas, and we leave nothing to be questioned. If there's a chance that someone may question us, we don't do it. If there is the slimmest chance that someone could be led astray, we don't do it. Our goal is to worship God, and we do it by living daily to please Him and Him alone. He's called us to be holy. Next thing we see is this. Is that we live like Christ by not looking like the world. See what he says there in verse 2? 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world. But what? Be transformed. We change. We are changed. We're not to be what we once were. We don't live like we used to live. We are changed. We're different. I think of 2 Corinthians 5.17 when Paul writes, For those who are in Christ, the old is gone and the new has come. Right? You are a new creation. You're changed. You're transformed. Listen, if there's no transformation, there's been no salvation. When there's salvation, change comes to our life. If we're truly in Christ, we're to be transformed. No longer living like the world. No longer living the way we lived before we came to know Christ. We stand apart from the world. Listen, if we were to stand side by side as a Christian, and I had another person beside me who was not a Christian, and we compared our lives, my life should be drastically different than the way this person's life is. I'm not to look anything like that. My life is to be different, is to be changed, is to be transformed. We're not to live like the world. We don't conform, he says, to the patterns of the world. Instead, you're transformed. No longer like them. The world's motto is this, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's not the motto of the, of the church. The motto of the church should be what Paul says. I no longer live but Christ lives in me. That should be our motto. Yes. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Right? I die to myself. I live only for Christ. When you die to self and you live to Christ, you give up all the rights to your life. It's like Paul said, your life is not your own. You were bought with a price. You know what that price is? It's Calvary. It's Jesus. Who died on that cross for you. So you and I today, we need to understand we're not to live like the world. We're not to look like the world. Instead, the last thing he tells us is this. Since we live like Christ by transforming, by being transformed in our minds. Our minds have to be transformed. Meaning this. We cannot think the way we used to to think. See, in the past, our thoughts were all about me. It's on ourselves, right? What I wanted. What I thought was right. What I thought was okay. What I thought was acceptable. What pleases me? What makes me happy? What do I want, right? But now our thoughts, if we have been saved, if we are being a living sacrifice, if we are being transformed, beginning in our mind, it says our, our thoughts must be on God. What is it that He wants for me? Not what I want for myself. What does God want? The language I use changes. The thoughts I used to have changes. The hatred, the bitterness, the selfishness, the impure thoughts, the divisiveness, everything that begins in the mind needs to change so that I can please God. That's transformation. And that's what Paul's word has called us to. If we are a living sacrifice, there has to be change. As a living sacrifice, it's not about me anymore. It's only about Jesus Christ. And for him alone. He said, man, when you do this, what's he say there in verse 2? He said, when you do this, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. When you surrender it all to the Lord, he said, God, I just want to live for you. I just want to please you. I, I don't care about me anymore. I don't care about my, my desires and my dreams and my wants. I want my desires and my dreams and my wants to be everything that you want. And when you get to that point, I've had people say, God, I'm trying to find God's will. I'm trying to see what God wants. I'm like, first of all, give your life to Jesus. That's where it starts. That's where it happens. And then he says, then you will know. Then you will know. Then you will worship him in the right way. Then you will know his will. And you will be pleasing. The perfect will of God will be a part of who you are. Last thought you see on the screen is this. To live like Christ is to be committed to Christ. And to be committed to Christ 
it is to sacrifice all. Can you say that's true of you? Are you committed to Christ? And if you're committed to Christ, are you sacrificing everything for Christ? Because he sacrificed everything for you. Amen? I want to ask the praise and come.